Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. We are just going to let people kind of fill in a little bit before we begin. Um, until now, just know we are here. We welcome you and thank you for, for coming. Okay, so <clears throat> welcome everyone uh, to 10 Principles for Bridging Communities in Times of Crisis. This is our second installment in a webinar series that's discussing uh, communities' general responses to the COVID-19 pandemic and how we can help to support each other in, our, in all of our work. Uh, my name is Daniel Pagan and I'll be moderating today's uh, webinar along with Kian Lee. And before we start, I'd just like to go over a bit of housekeeping. Um, so to get you all quickly familiar with the GoToWebinar system here, um, you can you know, use the arrow here to open and close the panel in case you want more space on your screen. And of course, all participants right now are, are muted. Um, we will be monitoring the, the questions and we will have some time to answer those questions later on. Uh, and of course, the webinar is being recorded and the recordings will be shared out with everyone along with PowerPoint slides and related resources uh, by next week. Um, please do submit your questions. As I mentioned, we will be monitoring those. And my, my colleague, Evelyn Heltzel, will also be monitoring um, for any technical issues or anything. But also please email her directly if you are having any audio, or audio issues um, at her email here at the bottom. Okay. And also in the handouts section of the GoToMeeting, uh, you can see, sorry, GoToWebinar, uh, you can see that we have the PowerPoint slides and the panelists' bios as well. Um, so feel free to download those now. Um, again, they will also be sent out afterwards. Um, before we begin, I would like to just get a quick sense um, of, you know, who is in our audience today. So, let's see. Yeah. So I'd like to just, if you all can take uh, the next 30, 40 seconds to fill out the poll, um, we'd really appreciate that. And of course, just choosing, you know, you have the best, uh, what is your primary role that kind of brings you here today? Um, and so far we have about 111 people who have signed on so far. Numbers are still growing. <laughs> I'm sure by 11 or 12.50, we'll, we'll have everybody in. Okay, so let's see. Just give a couple more seconds for the poll. Okay. Okay. So looking at our results here, ooh, it's hard for me to see. Uh, looks like we've got a good good bunch of people from the mutual aid group. Our collective action, our community nonprofits, uh, also a large portion of researchers, evaluators, academics, um, smaller with the national 
local intermediaries, their philanthropies and government agencies. Um, but welcome all, and we're happy that you are here. Okay. Okay. So back to the presentation. Um, so today, of course, we'll just be reviewing the introduction. Uh, Kian will be reviewing the introduction as well as the panelists, uh, and then going over content action principles for bridging communities. And then we'll have some pauses built in just for the audience questions, as well as, um, you know, of course, our panel discussion. And with that, I will uh, kick it off to Kian. Thank you, Daniel. Good afternoon or good morning to everybody, depending on where you are in the country. Thank you for joining our webinar today because we know you probably have many other webinars and Zoom meetings you could be on at this time. Uh, I hope that you and your loved ones are all healthy and safe right now. It's no secret that our communities are very diverse and history has shown how easy it is to blame another group of people for the problems facing our own community. This happens, you know, um, because of misinformation, stereotypes, competition for resources, political agendas that are divisive, and of course, racism and other forms of discrimination. Research has shown consistently, as well as our experiences, that bridges across differences can be most effectively built when our community has something in common with another community that compels us to work together rather than against each other. It is ironic that moments like now provide an opportunity for building bridges and working across race, ethnicity, religion, culture, and other factors that typically divide us. I've heard this over and over in the news of late. This is an opportunity for us to rethink how we relate to one another and how we transform our systems to be more equitable. But we have to be really intentional about seizing this opportunity and in our strategies, because it isn't easy, as many of you know, to break down the barriers that have divided some of our communities for so long. And this is why we at Community Science were motivated to have this webinar today. I'm going to ask our esteemed panelists today to just introduce themselves. Can you please state your name and the organization you are from at this time? And I'll start with kind of who I see on the screen. I'll start with John. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much for having me today. My name is John Yang. I am the President and Executive Director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AHAC which is a nonprofit civil rights organization based in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Rachel. Thanks, Ken. It's great to be uh, joining everyone today. I'm Rachel Parrish, and I'm the executive director of Welcoming America, uh, and I'll share more about what we do in a little bit. Thank you. Mia. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having me, Ken. My name is Mia Ramirez. I am a community partner at the Colorado Trust. We are a place-based, resident-driven grant maker based in Colorado, and my specific area is um, a five-county region in southern Colorado, and I'm based in Colorado Springs. Thank you. Mary. Uh, hello. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, Mary Moran, Executive Director of Argos and Estrebos. We're an issues organizing shop uh, in New Orleans. Thank you, everyone. We're so excited that you're able to join us today. I really appreciate it. Um, next slide, please, Daniel. So what you see on the screen now are 10 principles, action principles for building bridges across communities. Community Science has reviewed the literature at length and evaluated many projects. And we have found over and over again that these 10 action principles are really critical when you are building bridges across communities and creating unlikely partnerships. I'm not going to go over each of these in detail. You will receive the information in a couple of days, as Daniel mentioned earlier on. But I will emphasize what is most important here. Overall, the key is to focus on commonalities and not differences, which is what we often do when we bring together people from different backgrounds. For instance, how many of you probably have experienced this? We organize a potluck so everybody can get to know each other. And then we ask people to share their traditions. But we always focus on the what, like what is the dish? And when they name the dish, it always sounds so exotic and so different. What we don't intentionally do is to go deeper and lift up the how and the why behind the dish and the traditions. 
If we did this more intentionally, I bet we'll learn that the dish is significant. Each dish is significant because part of the it's part of the process of preparing the food, um, and it's part of the process of family coming together and passing along family traditions. So I'm not sure no matter what culture you come from, that's going to be important and that's going to be the similarities that we can often find and celebrate together. Another critical point is understanding how communities are self-organized to help their members. Some communities look very organized to the outsider because they have a range of nonprofit organizations and it is fairly easy to identify them and their executive directors from the internet or by walking down the street. So maybe these days that, that, that's not such an option. Um, but some communities look really disorganized from the outside because they don't have many or any nonprofits. But that is not necessarily true. Communities are often organized into informal groups with informal leaders, which are not obvious to the outsider. And to engage communities in an authentic way and to be able to reach deep and wide into a community, we cannot assume anything about how a community is organized and instead, we have to keep an open mind and ask lots of questions. And I'll say more a little bit about this later. The last important point is to identify and work toward a common goal, often a goal that no single community can achieve or achieve well by itself. And by working together on this goal, relationships and trust build and become stronger over time. A common goal can be anything from advocating for a community garden safe playgrounds, a grocery store that sells healthy and fresh produce. And as one of our panelists in, um, said in the last webinar, to advocate for moving our homeless off the streets into a self -shelter, safe shelter, especially during this pandemic. What we have seen in our work over and over again is the approach where people meet and meet to no end to learn about each other as opposed to actually doing a project together. And through that process of doing, learn to work with one another, get into conflict, overcome the conflict, and appreciate each other as people, and not just solely as representatives of another group. But it's not all a bed of roses. These relationships and trust build and become stronger only and only if the communities have resources and support to manage and transform the conflicts that will inevitably occur. Next slide, please. I'm going to shift now to the first action principle of identifying informal leaders and groups. How do you do that? Well, the first step is not to make any assumptions and ask lots of questions. I can't overemphasize how this is probably the hardest thing for everyone to do, because you have to take a step back look inside yourself and be mindful of your stereotypes and perceptions about other people who appear different from you. It's years and years and years of this information just implicitly in your brain that you may not even realize it and learning to become more mindful of those things. And you will make mistakes, but the most important is to pause and learn from those mistakes. So here are some questions that you can ask of people from the group that you wanna bridge with. So with the first three questions, you're looking for influences in that group, right? What's like, who, who do you go to for help? Who do you trust? Who do you listen to? The keywords in these questions, help, trust, listen, that will help you identify who the influences are. Then you are attempting to understand information channels. How is information shared? And where do people gather to exchange information? These are usually the natural gathering places. And finally, you can't just walk into any group. Who can help make that introduction and who can broker the relationship? Next slide, please. So who and where do you go to ask these questions? And here's some images of some places that you can start with. Um, there are faith-based institutions. There are you know, local civic associations, youth groups. There are local, you know, ethnic grocery stores and other kinds of markets that you can go to. And if you go to these places, you can ask the owner, you can ask the manager those questions, and you'll uncover sort of the influences in these communities. Next slide, please. There are also other groups, right? There are fraternal, fraternal, um, the sororities and fraternities. Um, 
there are you know places that um sort of the media outlets there are those places chambers of commerce um those kinds of places and then you know if maybe not these days but typically if you walk out you can see people gathering in the parks um, sports leagues and places like that these are places that you can go to and ask these questions and you can begin to uncover those informal networks that people are so much a part of next slide please so in this slide, I just want to actually just sum up the four most important things to keep in mind and not make any assumptions about. Leaders can be an elder. They can be the nonprofit director. They can be the local elected official. They can be the neighbor who watches out for all the kids, the exiled political figure from someone's home country, and more. They come in all shapes and forms. A community is never homogenous. There are smaller communities nested in a big community and more communities nested in a small community. They can be based on socioeconomic status, gender, sexual orientation, religion, et cetera. Faith institutions have different roles and capacities in different cultures. Some churches and pastors are very comfortable with advocacy. On the other hand, some Hindu temples and priests are not. So you have to be cautious about what is culturally appropriate for that particular faith group. And as I mentioned before, some forms of organization are simply not visible. So with that, I'm going to pause here and turn it over to Daniel. Are there any questions in the chat box, Daniel? We don't have any questions yet. Oh. Okay. Um, Got one. So yeah, I just got one actually now. Uh, so, you know, in in these times of of sheltering in place, you know, what are what are some examples of how these engagement strategies you just kind of went over, Kian, would be adapted? Do you have any ideas? And of course, open up to the panelists as well if they have any anything to say on that. Yeah, um, I think actually the panelists have a lot of good idea. I think that it's the the biggest and most obvious one is that you can't physically go someplace right and and go visit a place so what do you do to to make calls like basically we have to go back to the good old telephone um and the internet and how do we connect with people via email and telephone to even ask these questions um that really is the biggest one right off the top of my mind like i said you can't walk down the street and look for where people are playing soccer right now um so I really have to depend on those kind of more um social media sites where people are exchanging information looking for those kinds of sites um you know facebook you know where people might be creating new groups so that they can connect that would be a place to look i'll invite the panelists if they have anything they want to add to that i know we'll be saying more about it later but if there's anything you want to add to that right now please feel free you ready No. Okay. All right. Well, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves again and to talk more about their work now and what they're doing to bridge communities. Um, so I'll just start. Maybe I'll start the other way around. Mary, do you want to go first? <laughs> um, sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Mary. Uh, I am Mary Moran, and I lead an organization here in New Orleans. Uh, we uh, organize families, specifically Black and, La and Latino immigrant, um, Central American, mostly families. Uh, one of the um, one of the things that I think is important about the context of uh, New Orleans is that um you know it's the deep south and it's the stronghold of white supremacy of slavery and uh the history of these things are still very much alive um so that plays out in different ways right that plays out in uh and you may see uh i'm sorry in addition to the introduction of the organization i'm uh talking about uh what we're doing right now correct yes okay <laughs> um, <laughs> before I just go fully on. Uh, but yeah, I, so I think all of that is present, all of that specifically uh, sometimes comes up as we organize Black and Brown families. Um, 
because of uh, both le everything from leadership, right? And how do you get black leadership or white leadership to advocate not just on behalf of um, poor black people, but then specifically poor undocumented uh, and newly arrived uh, brown people, indigenous people. And so uh, working on some of that, everything to then when you get to the grassroots, you know, and uh, when you're just with out in the community, uh, you know, one of the things that comes up is, um, can everyone receive, especially in as we talk about uh, COVID uh, and these times, you know, are uh, sort of the leadership of community organizations advocating on behalf of undocumented folks in addition to uh, Black folks or then on the ground level, uh, you know, how can you get um, schools to give their hotspots to uh, undocumented families before and you know sort of how you give and get resources all of that comes into play um, and our job really has been having conversations lots of conversations with people and helping people to reframe some of these issues uh, and to really understand uh, what our different communities uh, are experiencing during this time. Thank you, Mary. We'll go to Mia next. Thanks, Ken. So again, Mia Ramirez with the Colorado Trust. Uh, we're a private foundation in the state of Colorado and I work in Colorado Springs um, and the largest surrounding county. My focus is working with neighborhoods. And so I think this has been um, a particularly challenging time for a neighborhood, which um, we've worked over the years that they're connected and in frequent contact. And so I think under the current situation with COVID, it's introduced some unique challenges. And the biggest lesson for me has really been to step back and make sure that people have the tools and resources um, that they need to continue to connect and bridge, which feels more urgent and um, pressing than ever. And so I've sort of learned to follow their lead. Um, so as you mentioned earlier, um, one of our residents wanted to start, start a call tree. She was feeling really isolated. Um, she largely lives alone. She has an adult daughter who visits occasionally, but she said, I'm really struggling. And if I'm struggling, I wonder if my neighbors are too. Would you be willing to share your contact list? Uh, so over the years, we've collected a contact list with different people we've met and worked with, and we shared that with her. And she created an old fashioned calling tree and recruited her neighbors. And they call folks every week just to check in and see how folks are doing. I think social media has been another venue. Um, largely, historically, their neighborhood social media page has been about um, different events or things happening in the neighborhood. And it's been interesting to see the nonprofits reach out to the neighborhood leaders and say, hey, we have this service or program or resource. Can you please share it on your social media pages? Because we don't have another way to get the word out right now. And so being looked to as a leader in those communication strategies is a real shift and a real source of pride for that neighborhood and their social media being leveraged in that way. And then finally, I think, um, you know, I got a call a couple of weeks ago from two youth organizers in, the, in one of the neighborhoods. And they said, you know, there's so many people out walking um, more than ever. We've never seen this many people walking and yet we can't connect, we can't say hello. Um, would you be willing to um, get us some signs, yard signs that we can boost morale and let people know we're still here and that we're thinking of them um, in all of this. So we bought a large number of signs and the youth put them all up around the neighborhood. Um, and it was just something they felt good about and felt really needed. So I think that's been one of the ways that we're continuing to help support bridge building in these unique times. 
Thank you, Mia. I just want to emphasize, you know, a little bit of what Mary said and Mia said that are really reflected in the principles, right? Mary mentioned history, you know, the history of slavery that's still very present today that affect the way relationships are formed and they shape how people think about each other. And that's something that you, you always have to pay attention to. What, what's the history of that community there? Um, and how do, you know, how does it, that history get perceived and how does it get shared? That's an important piece of the um, bridge building. And as Mia said, I mean, I think we sort of, how do you do it in these times, you know, I think they both mentioned, Mary mentioned to hotspots, right? How do you create like sort of the, 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 um, the portable kind of wireless cards, hotspots and all this stuff that can be shared, signs in yards, um, you know, social media sites, as well as just a telephone tree. So these are just some of the examples that you both mentioned I wanted to lift up right now, especially before I forget them as we go through all four. I will now turn it to Rachel. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Um, so I'm, again, Rachel Parrish, and my organization is called Welcoming America. Uh, and our work is really about uh, supporting communities um, to put in place both the policies and also the culture that uh, helps everyone, including immigrants, uh, to be able to thrive and, and to belong. Um, and I'll give you uh, a little bit of our origin story because I think it, um, it'll, it'll help you understand how we came to this work of bridge building. Um, and that is, uh, in the early 2000s, uh, our founder uh, had started an immigrant rights organization that was working in the American South. Uh, and um, as uh, demographic change was happening uh, and as communities uh, were changing really fast, um, the tensions were building and everything that they were trying to accomplish on the policy front just be became more and more difficult. Um, and there was this sort of breakthrough moment that came uh, when, um, when the organizers realized that they needed to do a different kind of organizing. Um, that was not just about organizing for policy change, but really organizing for culture change uh, and helping bridge um, some of the very clear divides uh, between people who were new in the community and people who had lived there all their lives. Uh, and so they started an initiative um, that did that and you know, maybe followed some of the best practices you shared, Kian, uh, maybe didn't, <laughs> um, but ultimately um, helped people connect over their values. Um, and that ended up setting the stage for uh, for really good policy work to uh, to take shape at the local level, um, and um, and from that work, uh, Welcoming America was created to help uh, communities all over the country that were uh, struggling with that same challenge um, of working in some places where there was a lot of fear um, and um, and uh, resentment and xenophobia and and trying to move past that, um, and also to support places when they were in a position to do so to really build. Um, the infrastructure and the policies to make sure that uh, that could be just self-reinforcing. Um, and I think a, a great example of that right now uh, is Salt Lake County, which a few years ago went through this process of bringing leaders in the community together to say, what would it look like for this place to be a more welcoming one that led to creating uh, an office uh, within county government um, that is now you know, essential <laughs> to uh, supporting the rest of government um, to make sure that immigrants um, not only aren't vilified or scapegoated, um, but are really um, part of the solution and, and really recognized as leaders um, in an inclusive emergency response. And um, even in this really challenging time, the, the silver lining that I see uh, in the work that we do is that there are leaders all over the country and, and in fact, all over the world who are doing this work um, of building an infrastructure to make their communities consistently be doing bridge building work, removing barriers to opportunity um, and leadership. Uh, and, um, and I'm really proud of that. <laughs> uh, and, um, and I think, you know, to the, to the question about um, what are people doing now, I think it's really difficult to build a bridge <laughs> Uh, when you're in the middle of a rainstorm and the river is flooding. This is work that, you know, is long term. <laughs> if we if we build the trust and relationships coming into this moment, you know, that bridge is stronger uh, and we can use it to um, to make sure that more people's lives are saved, um, frankly, right now. Um, but at the same time, I also think that there are some practical things that that can be done right now to bring people together. And I'll um, just share this one example from Louisville, Kentucky. Um, so the city of Louisville uh, also has its own uh, welcoming agenda um, and an office 
um, that they created um, uh, to support this kind of work. Uh, and uh, that office a couple weeks ago convened uh, faith leadership, uh, immigrant leadership, um, uh, some folks from um, the Office of Equity uh, and others in the community for a virtual town hall to talk about, you know, how do we uh, in this moment show up for one another? Um, how do we um, push back against some of the dangerous narratives that we're hearing? Um, and, you know, part of the answer to that is not only about identifying uh, where, um, you know, where we're seeing incidents of hate so that we can boundary that and, and tell people not to do that, um, but also lifting up the kind of um, positive role models um, that we see all over the country who are doing the exact kind of work that you um, talked about in your in your 10 examples, Kian. So I know we'll talk more about that, but thanks again for the opportunity to join you. Thank you, Rachel. Appreciate that. Taking it to a whole different level when you talk about local government involvement as well. And last but not least, John. Sure, thank you very much. Again, the, my name is John Yang. I'm the President and Executive Director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. So our organization is part of a network of five independent affiliates in San Francisco, Atlanta, Chicago, and Los Angeles that all op operate under the same brand. Uh, we also have community partners throughout the country, over 160 community-based organizations located in 34 states, as well as the District of Columbia. We like to work as a network of Asian American organizations for our organization, our mission is to advance the civil and human rights of Asian Americans and to promote a fair and equitable society for all. So what that means is that we're, if you think about it, more of an advocacy organization. So certainly my counterparts, the people that I work with most, most frequently at the national level would be people like the NAACP Legal Defense Fund or the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund, but sort of on the lawyer's end, if you will, in advocating for change, uh, if necessary, suing for change, right? Uh, sort of the base areas in which we work certainly include immigration, census, voting rights, discrimination, tech and technology, and telecom. What that looks like in the COVID-19 environment, some of these you could imagine right away. First and foremost in the Asian American community right now is the anti-Asian hate that all of us are seeing. You know, our organization has a website that's standagainsthatred.org, www.standagainsthatred.org, that tracks uh, hate incidents involving Asian Americans and gives a vehicle for people to self-report these incidents. There's a couple of other organizations in California that has a similar vehicle. You know, collectively, our data shows right now there have been over 1,700 acts of hate against the Asian American community in the last six week period. And that's only self-reported, which we know is underreported. That involves verbal assault, involves name calling at one end, spitting, uh, bullying when children were still in school, you know, kids getting slammed up against lockers. And in the extreme incidents, as you probably read in the news, have involved a, a stabbing in Texas, has involved an acid dousing in New York. I've been, there's been some horrific things. And certainly for our organization right now, part of it is to speak up against these, uh, these acts and to make sure that people use the right terminology when we're talking about COVID-19 or coronavirus. You know, early on, unfortunately, uh, and even still, there are certain elected leaders that have used the terms Chinese virus, Wuhan flu, uh, Kung flu, or variants of those. And so we know what happens. These words matter. When people use words like this, it stigmatizes the Asian American community, makes it appear that Asian Americans are somehow carriers or transmitters of, of this virus, which we all know is not true. You know, medical and scientific ep experts also agree. Those terms add nothing to science and medicine, and they add stigma to the community. So it's making sure we call that out. Journalists, media has been pretty good about doing the right thing, so to speak. Uh, some elected leaders have been good, others not so good. And so trying to continue to lift up that message and lift up the effect that it has on the community. Uh, one of the other things that we're really proud of right now, specifically in addressing this anti-Asian hate, is we've started to do what's called bystander intervention training. It really give a vehicle for people uh, to do something if they see an act of hate in, in, in front of them. Now, one thing I always emphasize is we don't want people to be superheroes. We're not asking you to put yourself in a situation where you yourself are not physically safe. But there's oftentimes little things that people can do. Just going up to the victim and saying, hey, are you okay? Hey, can I take you to a place of safety? Or telling someone else, 
can you call a police officer over here, right? That can make that victim feel so much more safe, so much more protected, and really reduce the amount of mental trauma that that, that victim is facing. And so we're trying to make sure that that happens. What's beautiful about that is uh, the number of people that have volunteered for these trainings, attended these trainings that are not just Asian Americans, but people of all ethnicities, all faith. Because frankly, as we all know, all communities of color are suffering during COVID-19. We're suffering in different ways, whether it's health disparity, whether it's the xenophobia that's hitting us in all different ways. Uh, and this othering is just something that we need to avoid. You know, it's interesting because on one level, we have what I call physical distancing that we need to, uh, we need to enforce, we need to be very vigilant about. But finding ways to maintain that social connection while we have that physical distancing is, is, is so important. And I've been heartened during this time to see how many different communities, whether it's the African-American and Latino community, whether it's the Jewish community, all sort of rallying to support the Asian community when it comes to uh, this hate incidents piece. And you know, part of it, I think for us is also making sure that we reciprocate. I I'll be brutally honest, the Asian American community has not always been great about standing in solidarity for other communities of color. So we're trying to use this as an opportunity to build that bridge, make that bridge stronger, and, and making sure that we all stand together about that. Lastly, I'm gonna make a plug on, and, and then certainly I'll yield the floor, is on census. Uh, 2020 is a census year, and hopefully all of you have already participated in the census. If not, go online to uh, 2020census.gov and fill out the census, because that is critical to all of our communities to make sure that we have the resources that we need, make sure the businesses supply the products that all of us deserve. And unfortunately, during COVID-19, that has really disrupted how a lot of the community organizations have been able to do that outreach. You know, typically for a lot of our communities, we really require sort of churches. We require people that are essentially canvassers go up and do door knocking to help people feel comfortable about participating in what is essentially a government survey. Because of physical distancing, that doesn't happen in the same way. And so certainly I'm relying on forums like this for all of you to help get out the word because that is going to form the foundation to the data on our communities over the next 10 years. So I can't understate the importance of this, even from a civil rights perspective. Well, thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. Um, you know, I, I just think it's incredible. First of all, I want to say just the amazing work that you all are doing. You, you're on the front lines in so many different ways. I think, Mary, you're right on the ground working with black, brown parents, trying to organize and, you know, making sure that this continues to be quality education, right, for the children whose education is so disrupted right now. Mia, you're working regionally on the ground on behalf of a foundation, right? Trying to help support communities that are organizing, right? And I know, you know, personally through our work that you're on the front line as you walk in and you start to help a community get organized and support them and then transition the leadership over to them. And Rachel, you're doing it, you know, at a national level between immigrants and receiving communities and having local affiliates, lo working with local governments. And John, you know, as a national, you know, advocacy organization, working with other national advocacy organizations that represent different racial groups. And so in so many ways, you're bridging community on so many levels, which is one of the principles, right? That in order for bridging to be sustained, um, it needs to have support, right? From different institutions, you know, all the way from local to national and even our government. So. I think you just all embody those principles and what we really um, need in place. Um, I, I wanna ask you this because this work didn't just happen yesterday, you know, or last month when the pandemic started, you've been doing this work for a long time. And those 10 principles look so simple. 10 principles, if you follow this, you'll get it right. No way, we know how complex this is, right? Um, the history and you know media and all of that plays into what we're continually trying to do. And I just feel very strongly that if we don't do it now, when we come out in recovery and rebuilding, we just will be back to square one. So we have to keep at this. So with this, I'm gonna ask you all um, this question. Knowing how, how much you've been doing this, knowing how hard it is, um, what are some of the particulars the details 
um, the kind of minutia that you have to be very mindful of and pay attention to when you're trying to do that bridging work. And whoever's ready, just please share. Well, perhaps let me start uh, since no one else. Oh, did Mary, did you I, want to start? Was Mary going to say something? Can you just say the question one more time? I'm sorry? Oh, the question? What are the particulars, the details, the minutia, the little things that, that can become big things if you don't pay attention to it in this kind of bridging work? You know, that's very easy for people to forget about or to overlook. From my perspective right now, the one organizing principle for us is how do we help protect the Asian American community during this time? Uh, it, what's interesting is obviously you guys know the Asian American community is extremely diverse, right? In the United States, we're probably talking about at least 50 different racial ethnic uh, ethnic groups at least over a hundred different languages and certainly as i always joke back in asia you know, a lot of these groups didn't get along with each other there's a history of wars there's a history of fighting and so it's kind of an artificial construct in, certain, in a certain way in the united states so when we're talking about this how do we bring these groups together especially this time i, I agree with Ken. It's, it's an opportunity because it's it's an opportunity to set aside some of those quote unquote differences, some of that history, and just kind of remain focused on the goal, which is how do we help our community right now, right? And if we focus on that, uh, you know, it's interesting because, you know, part of what I've been trying to do is also bring in groups that politically might not sit in the same space, right? And that's okay. People will have different strategies, and that's an asset if we can recognize it as such. And just focus on that goal because we focus on the goal okay here you can perfect the asian american community by doing this right by showcasing how asian americans are working on the front lines whether as doctors whether as grocery store workers you know you could focus on the benefits that asian american organization has done in providing ppe or you could focus on you know what the asian american community is facing you know what their small businesses are facing there's all of these different elements and, and no one organization, no one group can do it all alone. That's certainly the case. And, and so if we give each other the space to say, all right, you know, we appreciate what you're doing in this space and that's helping our community. Uh, that helps a lot at least, at least for me, I felt like that's been very, very helpful in decreasing some of the tensions that, that, that traditionally sometimes exist. Thank you, John. I, I think you you iterate the fact that communities are nested within communities, right? There's never a, a community that's homogenous, especially not the Asian American community. And also, more important, is sort of what does each what what, the, what can each group bring to the table, right? And that's their unique strength. And then how do you build on all of those unique strengths to create a whole? Um, I think that's really important. Rachel, uh, Mary, Mary, yeah, go ahead. I can go. I think one of the main things that I can always tell is just someone's vibe, right? If someone's vibe is, is not about bridging, then, you know, you can start to have more, you know, either probing conversation and questions that's going to sort of lead you either to anti-Blackness, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to lead you to anti-immigration sentiment, you know, sentiments that exist and uh, in both communities and all around, right? When we think about the immigrant community here in New Orleans, we're talking specifically uh, a large population of Garifuna, of Black people. Um, and anti-Blackness can exist within our own communities, right? Anti, it, depending on what immigration wave and how, what your uh, economic status, all of that, it, it just, you can you pick up on the vibe first, and then as you get into the conversation, all these things come up, um, and you just know that either you know uh, we're all at different places in terms of our bridging. Maybe it's that we uh, can't think about bridging because we really need that service, right? Whether it's that money, whether it's you know. Um, or whatever service that you know you're trying to seek, either for rental assistance, for food, uh, and you can you know figure out where you need to start. Is this person at some level politicized, right? 
Uh, and if they're not, can you help them sort of have uh, conversations that will sort of get them to that place for us? It's all about the reframing and really being able to politicize folks so that they understand that, you know, uh, one, uh, immigrants, we didn't just show up uh, in New Orleans, right? And sort of understanding the commonalities of like uh, the banana republics and the raping of the land and uh, the exploitation and the extraction of the land and the people in Central America and its connection to um, the United uh, Farm Worker, I mean, you know, the United Farm Workers here in the States, but then also, I'm sorry, the United Fruit Company that uh, headquarters, uh, the building still exists. It's on St. Charles Avenue um, here in the city. And so really being able to reframe all of that. And at the end of the day, you know, when I'm talking to whether it's, uh, you know, elected leaders or uh, leaders in community, I'm really looking for, um, does this person believe? Does this person have hope? Does this person really uh, think that we can bridge and seize value? uh in bridging communities yeah thank you mary i thank you for bringing up also anti-blackness because i i think that is the form of racism that we all face um and it certainly will vary depending on your skin color right and so how do you deal with anti-blackness regardless of whether you're you know a dark-skinned person from south asia or you know you're an African American black in the U.S. or you're from you know the African continent. Like all of this, actually, the one common thing is that there is the racism, and it is based on skin color. So thank you for bringing that up, Rachel, Mia. Anything you want to add? Yeah, thanks, Ken. I would add. I think it's important to know, especially for the neighborhood work, to understand the history of the neighborhood from the people that live there. Um, I think a lot of things are left out of traditional media, and so it is creating space for the stories to understand. Um, when I'm reading about the school closure in the newspaper, I'm appalled. And in talking to them, this has been a story of boy who crawled, cried wolf for decades. Um, and so I think just understanding that context from the lived experience is part of that minutia, especially as you're trying to organize actions um, around improving equity and justice at a neighborhood level. I would also say it's important to understand who are the informal leaders or the helpers. So who has the neighborhood historically looked to for help? Who's on the front lines advocating um, and finding those folks um, and building relationships with them, which takes a lot of time and some of that, ref that warm referral, like, oh, who should I talk to about that? Or who helps you with that? and creating the space to really cultivate a relationship with those champions. And then finally, I would say, um, from a funder's perspective, um, who are the allies from the people that live there, especially when it comes to allocating foundation resources. Um, so making sure that those investments align with um, the values of the people that live there and will be most impacted by the efforts of those organizations. Um, you know, early on, you know, we would make grants based on outcome data or evaluations that really didn't tell the story about how these organizations impact the people. Um, and in working more closely with neighborhoods and asking, hey, what about this organization? How do they serve you? And getting that different perspective that can inform more meaningful and more impactful uh, foundation investments and I think there's a case to be made in my work for restricted funding. I know it's a bad word, but when you actually have the guidance from the people that will be impacted by these organizations, restricted funding is a tool to ensure resources get to the organizations that are closest to the people and are making the biggest impacts on their lives. Thank you, Mia. Yes, I think the history part is always really important. And all of you actually mentioned that today, the importance of understanding histories and how it shapes our perceptions um, and, and how we um, you know, shape our relationships with one another actually, which also means it takes a lot to transform those relationships, right? Because the histories also are, have created narratives. Um, sometimes the narratives are not correct either. And so having to change those narr narratives and shift those narratives over time. 
Rachel. Well, I think um, a plus one to everything that has been said so far. You know, I think all um, all social movements have their base builders and their bridgers, and sometimes the most difficult bridge to build is the bridge between between the base builders and those who are trying to create a larger tent. And probably all of us see that conflict <laughs> take place all the time. How do you maintain the integrity of what you're trying to accomplish um, while also bringing more people into it? And sometimes that in itself creates a lot of conflict. And so being able to create a way to mediate that um, is really important. And I think, you know, for those that have the luxury to step back like a funder, <laughs> um, you know, and, and take a more macro view at a community level of who all the players are and to be able, if you have the relational capital to facilitate some of that, it can be really powerful and we've certainly seen that. Um, I also think um, that, you know, it's okay for people, and I, we're all saying this in different ways, it's okay for people to play different roles in that, <laughs> in that ecosystem. And I think sometimes there are people um, in communities who are overlooked for the role that they can play as bridge builders. I think about artists um, and cultural institutions, especially in this moment, and especially when it comes to bridging some of the divides um, that I see around immigration, you know, the ability to communicate things um, in a way that transcends the English language, uh, the ability to help us understand complex ideas in simple ways. Um, those are important skill sets and ones that I think are often underutilized in communities. And I think, you know, all of all of the conversation about um, history and reconciliation, um, you know, being able to root people in a place and really understand that place. Um, you know, I, I think advocates can tap <laughs> um, other resources in the community that may be untapped right now to um, to help with that and also um, play a really important role in helping, um, for example, museums um, or other community organizations who don't, um, who know that inclusion is important, but don't quite understand how to get there, um, to be a, a, an asset to them in, in helping them do that work more, more effectively and more authentically. Thank you. Um, I have one more question for you, and then I think we might go to the chat to see if there are any questions there. Um, so I, I was actually talking to my colleague Daniel this morning, right, that that doing this work and sustaining this work is really, really hard, as you all know, and as many people probably on this um, who are listening in know, this is not something that happens overnight. It's not something that happens in a few years. Um, it can take generations. Um, and, you know, we I was sharing an example where, you know, we did some work in D.C. in, in the historically African-American neighborhoods with new immigrants come in. Um, we had youth working together and they they had to learn about each other's histories and learn about, you know, for immigrants coming in sort of the African-American history in that neighborhood and whose leadership and whose struggles they really build on. Right. They stand on their shoulders. Um, and there were a lot of physical evidence left behind. Um, this project that actually we worked on left behind murals. There were murals in the DC metro stations that represented the, the, the diversity of that neighborhood that was actually painted by um, Black, Latino, and Vietnamese youth who came together to create this, this mural that they felt really represented their neighborhood. In another place, it was you know an Ethiopian community that moved in and worked with the Black community there to really understand the history of that neighborhood that was so rich um, in in Washington D.C. And then you know gentrification happens, and the neighbors now look very different. Those physical evidence of what was left behind still there, but the stories are gone, right? So my question to you all is sort of you know in your work, what do you think? What, what have you had to do or what do you think it takes to sustain the work, to keep it moving so that we don't forget that easily, so that we can keep those relationships and sustain those bridges? I'll jump in and just say, I, you know, I think, um, Many people are talking about how this is a moment that is upending norms and how we want to come out of this with a new set of norms. And I think, you know, it's very clear that um, that this is one of them. Um, and I don't think that there's one easy answer to that. 
it's nobody's job really right now to create a community that everybody belongs in, <laughs> um, but it really needs to be everybody's job. Um, and you know, part of that is attaching it to the things where there's already political will. Um, and you know, when I think about um, a story that comes to mind uh, of Anchorage, Alaska, um, last year had an earthquake. Um, and because they had done the work to think about uh, think about who leaders were in the community in a different way, um, had worked to foster those relationships, they were able to move very quickly um, to respond to that, to get information out. And that is a, an element of resilience that, you know, whether we're talking about COVID or we're talking about an earthquake or climate change, that communities need as a whole. Um, I also think about census. You know, if you're a community that has done the work of bridge building, you're in a much better place now with those relationships established to be able to get information out about census. So I think we often think about bridge building maybe as a sort of add on thing that we'll do if we come around to it or, you know, a sort of touchy feely thing that uh, doesn't have, you know, tangible value. But um, I think now is a moment to really show the tangible value that it has for the entire community to benefit. Um, and I think we'll be well served by that. Thank you. I think you used two important words in there that, that is, is tied to this, right? Political will to do this and creating resilient communities when we're able to do this. I would add a couple of things that came to mind when you asked about sustaining the work in this way. Um, I think for me, the biggest lesson around that has been engaging people directly in the solution, um, especially as a foundation. It's easy for us to sort of just um, move resources really quickly without taking the intentional time to engage folks in that work. And what's been astonishing is that when folks are engaged actively in the solution, um, their momentum is sustained in a very different way. Um, they're able to work together and deepen relationships with, even though they're ne their neighbors, they've never really spent a lot of time with, with or gotten to know. Um, you know, there's this adage that the garage door opener um, sort of destroyed neighborhood life because you just sort of pull in and you don't really ever have to talk to anyone. Um, so working together to sort of implement that solution builds deeper relationships, which in the future, um, folks have navigated conflict much easier um, because they've done something together. They put that picnic together. Um, they did the community cleanup together. So now when you know conflict or tension is high in a rapidly gentrifying neighborhood, it's like, no, I know them. So we can work through this. So I think that's a huge one. Um, another huge lesson for me has been to honor those that community rhythm and finding those leaders or the champions and ensuring that um, at every chance we're deferring to their leadership versus sort of taking the helm. I think that sustains the, um, those relationships. I think it sustains the power that's naturally there in communities. Um, and then finally, as a foundation person, I think it's investing in the storytelling and making sure that the storytellers are actually the folks that are on the ground. Um, so, you know, we have a natural sort of pulpit with all of our uh, media work and it's ensuring that no the story isn't about me or my foundation colleagues let's get you to interview these residents or these community leaders and let them be the natural storytellers and the keeper of that history thank you yes um, i can go uh yeah i mean i think one of the hardest things about organizing is um how do you make it sustainable right and it's always about recruiting new leadership building more relationships uh, everyone isn't going to want to be on every campaign people cycle out naturally it's just a matter of it's just how organizing happens and so uh so build more leaders is <laughs> one um but then also there's a this piece around you know uh intergenerational leadership that is really really important um because yes, me are the storytellers, but you know, we all don't know how to be storytellers. And so it's it's actually something that we have to learn, right? And oftentimes we have to learn 
some of us have that gift as young children and some of us really have to learn and, and sort of come under elders to to learn that. Um, I think, you know, we always talk about what it means to um, to build and create more movement babies, meaning like uh, you don't have to wait until your uh, sociology class in undergrad to be politicized or to come into a kind of rethinking a reframing of um, what is actually happening around you. Uh, teach children at a very young age that poverty and all these issues that surround us, that we should internalize it, right? That it's not our problem, that it's not our family, that must be full of criminals and all of these things, right? And so like teaching young children, very young, that uh, sort of how they could be looking at the world and their neighborhood and their families. Uh, and then I think that beyond that, you know, one of the things that um, in uh, the social justice community, we always talk about in addition to uh, people, right, is the land and what it means to free the land, what it means to actually be reconnected to the land. And so I know a lot of people right now, uh, you know, all we have is we're inside, we're in our homes, right? And so uh, even if you don't have a backyard, um, you know, people are uh, starting uh, small gardens of herbs on their patios, on their, you know, uh, window seals. Uh, and so really being able to reconnect with earth, reconnect with the space, not both, you know, kind of your neighborhood, but also actually the land and being able to uh, reconnect to the rituals and traditions that come from your neighborhoods, that come from your culture, that come from uh, the people that you, you know, uh, are tied to. That's really important. Uh, learning songs, you know, uh, beadwork, whatever that is, it's, it's really important because uh, that is ultimately what sustains our community. Thank you, Mary. I would plus one on all of those. I think one thing that occurs to me also is just the length of these relationships. You know, I think about the fact that sometimes through my different cycles, you know, I lose touch with someone for literally about 20 years. And then 20 years later, I come into contact with them again. And the fact that we had a good relationship or at least a base of a relationship before allowed us to build that much more quickly. I, mean, I appreciate what Mary said about, you could tell pretty quickly who really is willing to work together, right? And, and those are the people that I certainly think you wanna hold on to, not necessarily that you're gonna always have constant connections with them, right? But you almost wanna have them in your back pocket at times because you never know when that connection comes up and will really prove to be useful at a particular time. I, mean, I, can't, I can't name the number of times that someone from my past is like, oh, hey, you know, we should talk to so-and-so about such and such. So I think that's useful. The other thing I would emphasize is the younger generation. Um, certainly within the Asian American community, part of it is because of immigration patterns. You know, we've had a huge surge of Asian immigrants in the last, you know, 50 years. And, and frankly, for some of the older Asian immigrants, they don't get it. I, I hate to be so blunt about it, but because they came over and they came over after the civil rights movement, they came over not knowing about the Chinese Exclusion Act or World War II and the Japanese American incarceration. They don't have the same view of history and the struggles that people of color have had here. But the younger generation does. And, and so if you focus a little, at least for our organization, sometimes it's focusing a little bit on, on them, having them be the storytellers and having them actually be the bridge to the older generation, to their parents and say, hey, dad, you really shouldn't talk this way because you know what, that's just wrong, right? Uh, and, and they could connect in a different way, right? That then sometimes sort of we're able to with that older generation. So I, that's the other, other thing I would add to this conversation about how to make things sustainable. Thank you, John, and thank you all of you. I mean, that that those are really some great tips and advice. I just wanna, sum up quickly because i think there's so much there that you all shared 
you know, it, it's not add-on work, right? Bridge building is something that everybody should be doing all the time and funders should be funding it, um, you know, not as an add-on component, but it should be part of everything, right? That, that we do on all our projects. Um, the importance of engaging people closest to the ground to work together on something, right? On a common project, on a common collective action. Like they're the ones that can come up with the solution. So engaging them um, to come up with the solutions, um, letting them tell the stories, right? Building sort of more leaders, leaders and a pipeline of movement leaders and movement participants and storytellers um, so that the information, the knowledge, the, the history doesn't get lost. Changing the narrative with children and young people from the start so that they're hearing the, the right, quote unquote, narrative about their people, about their history. Um, and using this time, even during the pandemic, to reconnect with traditions, right, and to connect with values that we've always had um, and using that as part of, you know, a bridging strategy. It doesn't have to be innovative all the time that we come up with new ideas, but maybe some of these like, you know, new ideas are actually old ideas that are traditions that we can bring back up and use those things as tools for bridge building. Um, keeping your allies close to you, I think, as John said, like, you know, you may need them in the future. So how do you maintain relationships? And, and that, you know, looking to the younger generation to be bridge builders, right? That they, they, they grew up in this country and they have the knowledge and the history and how do we use them more effectively as bridge builders? Um, with that, actually, I wanna see if Daniel, if there's a question in the chat box that you wanna raise. Um, if we have yeah. left. So, there's, um... Sorry, there's been a, a couple of questions kind of coming up, similar to what we've been, been talking about. So I'm going to kind of kind of cobble them together a little bit here. Um, Two-parter here for everybody. You know, what, what how, how are you measuring these relationships or the strength of relationship or impact that it could have in the community? And then how are you using those measurements or, or that evidence to leverage more resources from funders and people to show that this relationship building is and has been useful. Um, yeah. Is that a question from a researcher or evaluator? Okay. <laughs> <It may have been. laughs> Look, and, and I want to learn from the funders. I'm like, tell me. <laughs> tell, tell you what they want to see, right? right. What they what can do, the right? <laughs> Because from a community perspective, it's like, do you have the juice on the streets? Like, that's basically it. Like, <laughs> the people, you know, but yeah. <laughs> Mia, that's a challenge to you. <laughs> I heard it. I heard it loud and clear. I was trying to jot down my notes. Thank you. Um, you know, I think uh, in our foundation, I think there's been a lot of willingness to explore alternative evaluation metrics and measures. Um, and I know that's not true for other folks. So I'll just speak from my perspective. I think, you know, the way that we're sort of looking at um, the strength of relationship or evaluating the strength of relationship and, and essentially the impacts of those relationships um, are very simple things. Um, turnout at meetings, events, um, public actions, um, the number of actions completed, um, the scale of those actions or the scope of the action. And when I say action, I mean everything from like, hey, we really need to reactivate this park that has been taken over by undesirable activity and we need to have a picnic to, you know, providing testimony at city council about a policy change. So um, really looking across the spectrum about who's sort of on the mic for those five minutes, who's cooking the food for the picnic, all of those different um, ways of showing up and supporting community goals are metrics for us around relationship and impact. And then I think it's also evaluating who's called upon. So, um, you know, in the early days of the pandemic, the city local government had, had an idea um, to create a shelter in one of the community centers in an underserved community. Um, and they went direct, directly to one of the lead organizers and said, hey, what do you think about this? Um, so that's an indicator as well of relationship, 
um, who are the who are the leaders who has a say. Um, they didn't go to traditional nonprofit partners. They went directly to leaders in the neighborhood. Um, and I think it's the part about using evidence to leverage more resources. Um, I think as a foundation person, what's been more important is how do we leverage the relationships and impact story to actually capture public resources? Because foundation resources are temporary. As a foundation person, I feel pretty confident saying, you know, most foundation folks have a, you know, a five year sort of purview and those public dollars are more permanent. And so the way that we've been able to support these neighborhood teams is, hey, how are you going after the federal money, the state money, the local money, and let's support um, the relationships you created and let's share the successes that you've achieved in service to getting more of those government resources into community. Thank you, Mia. So it's everything from who shows up at meetings, who is the go-to, you know, for resources when they're getting allocated. And finally, how do you leverage additional resources that are more sustainable? I see Mary taking notes. <laughs> I was just going to say, I was going to offer an example of, uh, I'm from, originally from Oakland, California, and um, and I was going to offer the example of the Black Panther Party. Uh, and uh, when I think about the impact of um, the Black Panther Party, I'm just like, it's, it's something, you know, sure, you can measure, but, uh, but it, it's something worldwide, it's global, it's, you know, uh, and it's really re rethinking uh, sort of this idea of scale, right? And that scale isn't wide, but it's actually deep. And this idea of like, how can you actually, the vision, the values, the principles, right? Uh, the platform, that was something that was embodied. I mean, even now, you know, I could tell you the, 10 point, you know, uh, like the platform. And, but when we think about from a membership perspective, it was actually only 40 chapters nationwide and 5,000 members. Uh, that's not a lot. There's some organizations, community organizations that say they have more than 5,000 members, right? So when you think about the impact, it's, uh, it's not the same as the Black Panther Party. And, you know, obviously the times were different, you know, uh, there's a lot of different differences, but um, I'd like to just offer that as a way of thinking like that really scale isn't always about even, you know, as someone who's who was trained in, uh, you know, uh, PICO and organizing in that way. And so we think about, you know, exactly what you just said, public actions, how many research meetings did you have? How many people can you turn out? Uh, and all of that is very important. And also, you actually don't need a lot of people to make something happen. Uh, so long as you continuously make things happen, right? And uh, so there's, I think for us, it's really being able to figure out, you know, as also the, um, the context in which we're doing the work, as the landscape changes, what's our added value at each landscape? What's our added value uh, around a surround, uh, an issue that we're working on? Uh, is it best that we turn people out or is it best that we're actually the person who's helping to negotiate and to like write and draft the policy or you know whatever it is? And, uh, and even though there may be someone who is designated as the policy shop, it still may be that we're the pe person or organization that's best uh, equipped for that, given our perspective or you know whatever. And so, uh, yeah, th those are my thoughts. Thank you. Scale. That's that's definitely an important word, and we haven't talked about it, right? The scale of the impact and how do we look at that? I John, Rachel, you want to add? Yeah. Yeah, just to jump in. I mean, first of all, I think uh, if there's somebody in this group that can speak to <laughs> to how do you measure trust and um, you know what is produced by it, you may be <laughs> our greatest asset, Ken. Um, but you know, I think um, I think the the challenging reality is that the world that we live live in is a world where um, 
people don't see relationships as something that has an intrinsic value. Um, and so just as like a, you know, pragmatist, <laughs> um, I think what we found is the need to be able to, to also, and, you know, you all are saying this in different ways too, to be able to translate, uh, you know, what those relationships produce and then make sure that what those relationships produce structurally create the means to, um, to fund and support those relationships. So um, just to make that more concrete, um, we um, some years back created something that we call the welcoming standard. Um, we went out uh, to the field, can you were part of this too, and talk to uh, all kinds of people about what it meant to create a welcoming community. Um, and then what were the most important elements of that from a policy standpoint, from a practice standpoint, um, and that has become um, the roadmap for places that we work with, recognizing that they're in all different sorts of um, situations and the work may look different. Um, but we've also started certifying communities against that standard. Um, and what that process looks like is we go in and do an audit and say, you know, how are you performing against this, um, this benchmark? And then that gives them a way to be able to track their progress um, against other places and, and against their own performance. Um, and in the process of auditing them, the kinds of things that we look at are, um, you know, how do you do your code enforcement? <laughs> um, and as soon as you start unpacking what a code enforcement policy looks like, so much of that has to do with whether, um, you know, with perceptions um, and with culture um, and with all the kinds of things that, that bridge building needs to support. Um, so in order to have an effective um, not just a not just a code enforcement policy, but an effective code enforcement practice. You have to be doing the bridge building work. Um, so that gives us a, a a tool that we can use to go in and say, in order to in order to meet this um, in order to meet this this criteria, you need to be approaching it in this in this way. Um, and I share that. Um, just as an example of a way to maybe begin to connect some of the like interpersonal relationship building with some of the structural change that we also want to see. Um, and we certainly don't have it all figured out, but, um, but that's how we've, we've been approaching it. And uh, I think pretty soon we'll need to reopen that standard and think about what it looks like. And I think, um, you know, for us, one of the things that's been very clear in, in certifying communities, um, has been that bridge building is the place that people are most struggling with because it's hard <laughs> and it's resource intensive. Um, but I think if we can build um, build the set of practices that can outline into what we expect of our local governments, um, into what we expect of our communities to do, that's how we can begin to change the norm. And that's ultimately what we're after, um, is changing Great. what business as usual look like. Thank you, Rachel. And I'm sorry, John, we're actually out of time. I feel like that NPR the person that says, we have to go to commercial now. So with that, I just wanna thank our panelists today. This has been an incredible discussion and thank you for sharing your knowledge for our listeners for choosing this webinar. And I wanna thank my colleagues, Daniel, Evelyn, and Jasmine, who've worked behind the scenes to make this webinar happen. Please have a wonderful, safe, and healthy day. Thank you.